Good evening, everybody. I'm James Heimel. It's, I'm the president of China Institute, and it's a delight to welcome all of you here. Um, we're just seeing that people are signing on. We want to give everybody a, a chance to sign on. I know that we have nearly over 900 people, so it takes a little time for, for people to roll in. But I thought I'd just then, for those of you that know China Institute, fantastic. For those of you that don't, we were founded in 1926. So we've been helping Americans understand China through art, through its history, through its culture, by teaching Chinese, through our Center for Business, um, for nearly 100 years. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen us recently, we have a brand new home, well, a few years old, located in Lower Manhattan, just catty corner to 9-11, to where we're expanding into 50,000 square feet of space. Um, today, I'm just delighted to open up today's program celebrating 600 years of the Forbidden City and the Palace Museum. I was telling uh, the director, Wang Xudong, who we're just so excited to have on with us, that when I first went to China as a small boy, I was just six years old in 1967. My Chinese godmother, I was tired and exhausted and cranky and six years old. She said, when you've come to China, you're in Beijing, you have to come to see the Forbidden City. And it wasn't in nearly the kind of shape that it's been fortunate enough. Of course, that's in 1967, so we're going back nearly 50 years. Um, the extraordinary works of conservation, preservation, ongoing improvement that have taken place because history breathes and comes alive at the Forbidden City Museum. And today, we're just so fortunate to partner with the museum and with the leader of their team, uh, Wang Xudong, who is a member of the leadership team, not just only of the museum, but also of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism, which helps shape and guide everything that goes on in terms of culture in China. So uh, Wang Yuanzhang is a very well-known conservationist in his own right. Not only has he been involved in conservation projects, he presides over dozens and dozens of them in China and in overseas. Whether it's ancient caves or mural paintings or earthen sites, we know we're in good hands in the expertise of, Mr. of Dr. Wang. So tonight, tonight, we're really, really in for a treat. We're going to first hear from Wang Xudong, and then we're going to hear from other art experts in the area that are going to comment further after we've had the chance to open up. Um, we'll send out information as, as the evening progresses where you can log on and see what we're doing at China Institute, but I don't want to waste any more time. I want to hand it right over to uh, Director Wang Xudong to bring us in and share with us what he's prepared for us this evening. So thank you so much and a big welcome from all of us at China Institute and all of us in the United States who are watching. Over to you, Director Wang. Thanks, James. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you all friends online. It's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to attend the China Institute's wonderful lecture series, The Forbidden City at 600 Years. As you may already know, The Forbidden City has just celebrated its 600th birthday. This architecture masterwork of a complex is both old and new. It is old because it inherits 5,000 years of Chinese civilization and reflects time-honored traditional cultural values, such as the combination of rituals and arts, the harmony of man and nature, and the spirit of inclusiveness. At the same time, it is new because it has constantly changed over the past 600 years. Since the day the Forbidden City was completed, the mutual learning and exchange of culture and thought has never stopped. Against this backdrop, the Forbidden City is forging towards the future. Please take a look at this picture of Beijing by Xu Yang in the Qian Dynasty. Inspired by the Qianlong Emperor's poem, the painting vividly depicts 
Beijing's liveliness in winter. We see the Forbidden City at the city center while featuring a spatial combination of gardens and the palaces. Under the premises of respecting tradition and following the traditional ritual and the philosophy, ethnic and the regional cultures in the Forbidden City have also been integrating continuously. The palace earthly quality, the residential quarters of Ming Dynasty empresses was remodeled in the Qin Dynasty to suit the needs of Manchu sacrifices. Conversely, the Qin emperor's wedding ceremonies held here brought borrowed from the marriage customs of the Han ethnicity, promoting the integration of Manchu and Han. During the Qianlong Emperor's reign, the interior decorations in many buildings in the Forbidden City were made by craftsmen from Southern China, bringing together the cultures of the North and the South. Especially after the Qianlong Emperor's six inspection tours of southern China, out of admiration for the literati gardens there. Many classical scenes were reproduced in the Forbidden City. This development enriched the landscape building techniques of the imperial gardens and the depend their cultural significance. The Tower of Raining Flowers, the Hall of Imperial Peace, and the various Buddhist halls in the Forbidden City embody the culture exchange, integration, and the mutual influence of Confucianism, Taoism, Ta Buddhism, and Samanism. Since the 18th century, the constant exchanges of Eastern and Western cultures have brought further fascinating changes to the Forbidden City. For example, the flower clothes decorations not only feature Western style painters, but the dye used for the pink of the lilac painters is not a traditional Chinese plant pigment. It is the chemical product most likely imported from 19th Central Europe. The Bower of the Spirit Pool, a Western style building with the main structure formed from masonry and the mantle, was built in the early 20th century. Its steel beams are from the UK. The inner wall tiles are from Germany and the stone is locally sourced, making it a classic hybrid in its materials and the structure. Western painters, such as Giuseppe Castiglin from Italy, painting a large number of trampolier paintings for imperial buildings. This development promoted the integration of Western painting methods with traditional Chinese techniques and influenced, influenced chain court paintings and aesthetic tastes. Over the past six centuries, the Forbidden City has nurtured an eternal vitality and the charm through its all embracing, inclusive spirit. It has thus become, become both the model representative of Chinese culture and a world heritage site with outstanding universal value. On the occasion of the 600 years of the Forbidden City, we had a series of commemorative events, including exhibitions, film, and television works cultural and creative product distribution and the seminars. Our aim was to promote Chinese culture embodied in the Forbidden City.
and allow it to be known and loved by still more people from different cultural backgrounds. Coming from Donghua Academy to the Palace Museum, I strongly feel that China's cultural heritage needs to embrace an international perspective and keep an open mind in its conservation, management, interpretation, education, and so on. Donghua is located in the Northwest China, which is the Gobi Desert environment. If it was not for the Aussie's environment that attracted people on the Silk Road trade route between China and the West, we would not have the murals and the colored sculptures of the Mughal caves, which have been passed down for a thousand years. The Silk Road also was a route of technology dissemination and the culture exchange. One of its key characteristics was its com cos cosmopolitanism as it saw the dissemination of Buddhism to the central China and the evolution of Buddhist art. When this old treasure was handed over the Donghua new generation, we embarked on the journey of international cooperation joint research and the conservation and the preservation. In 1980s, Donghua Academy built very good relations with Japan's universities and other institutions about scholar exchanges and young staff training. In 1989, supported by the central government, the Donghua Academy and the Getty Conservation Institute at Los Angeles, cooperated in studying ways to monitor the environment and the sand control. Then have engaged the very uh, successful conservation and management projects, such as wall painting conservation, must plan, visit capacity, and so on for over 30 years. In 1999, under the support of the Mellon Foundation in New York. Donghua Academy worked with Northwest University in Chicago to explore ways of conservation through digitization. Donghua Academy also worked with other institutions in Australia and the UK and France and Italy, focusing on the management of sites and the conservation education. Gradually, a platform for international cooperation has been established. The Palace Museum has always been a model for global culture cooperation, having been open to international exchange since it was first established. The International Exhibition of Chinese Art held at the Royal Academy of Arts in London from 1935 to 1936, with the Palace Museum as the main lender remains a classic case of Chinese art exhibitions abroad. Particularly since the start of reform and opening up, the Palace Museum has continuously expanded its international cooperation and has established very good partnerships with major museums and the culture and educational institutions around the world. On the occasion of the 600 years of the Forbidden City, we proposed the goal of focus on the safeguarding academic research, digitization, and the vitality of the Palace Museum which we call the four Palace Museum measures. The realization of our plans depends on the opening up and the sharing of resources, international cooperation and exchange, and learning from others' strengths and experience. 
Today, with the help of fast developing technology, we believe that the road of openness and the sharing will be easier than ever. Scholars, experts, especially young uh, generation and the generation uh, general public from all over the world are welcome to join us about the Forbidden City, the conservation, preservation, research, and the interpretation, and so on. On this basis, we can enhance mutual understanding and recognition and jointly create a beautiful and wonderful future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Director Wong, so much for that wonderful and inspiring talk. Uh, you know, in these challenging times, arts, arts and culture exchange and dialogue is more important than ever. Um, and so we are so delighted and honored to be partnering with the Palace Museum on this important program. And thank you so much for your support, Wang Yunzhang. Um, we're very, very honored to have you with us tonight. So um, you're now in for another incredible treat. Um, those were wonderful images we, we looked at just now. And now we're gonna have two presentations about the life of women in the Imperial Palace. Uh, first, Jan Stewart, the Melvin R. Seiden Curator of Chinese Art at the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. Um, and Jan, of course, is especially known tonight for co-curating that magnificent exhibit of the Empresses of China several years ago uh, in collaboration with the Palace Museum. Um, and Jan is going to share some of her favorite objects used by women in the Imperial Court. After that, Dia Jing, who is deputy director of the Palace Museum's Architectural Heritage Department, is going to share some images and insights about women's quarters in the palace. And I might add that this is, of course, Women's History Month. So it's a particularly good time to be looking at all of these, um, looking at this history and examining the role of women in the Imperial Court. And after Jen and Dia Jing make their presentations, Jay Xu, who is director of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, is going to join the conversation for a wide ranging discussion about the life of women in the palace. Um, we're going to try to squeeze in some questions from the audience at the end if we can. So please feel free to type your questions in. We'll try to get to them. Not, no promises there because this, this program is going to go on until nine because it's a very, very special program. So we're going on for an hour and a half, uh, but we've got a lot, a lot of stuff to pack in. So um, Jan, we're so excited to have you. Uh, over to you. I'm trying to share my PowerPoint. Uh, just a moment. All right, it's a great pleasure to join this panel. And I thank China Institute for the invitation. It's a very special occasion. As this my opening slide points out, the artworks I will be showing tonight are in the collection of the Palace Museum. And I wish to acknowledge them and their photographers for the formal images I will be able to show, which I've also augmented with some of my own details taken from the works of art when they were on view. I appreciate the courtesy of the Palace Museum in allowing museum visitors to take photographs of works in an exhibition. Now, I want to begin by bringing attention to the exhibition that was just mentioned. The Peabody Essex Museum, my own museum in Washington, and the Palace Museum created a special exhibition for the United States in 2018 and 2019. Daisy Eo Wong, formerly of the Peabody Essex Museum, was my co-curator and co-editor of our book of this same title of the exhibition. The thoughts I am sharing tonight began as research for the Empress's project. But the role and lives of Qing Dynasty palace women, it, they, they're just so fascinating that the topic continues to occupy me. So look with me for a minute at this 70th birthday portrait of the remarkable Empress Dowager Chung Qing, mother of the Qianlong Emperor who reigned from 1736 to 1796. 
Tonight, I will be concentrating on the 18th century, but the story I am telling reverberates throughout the entire span of the Qing dynasty, that is 1644 to 1912. This is a formal portrait showing the Empress Dowager in the highest level of Manchu court dress. And remember, the rulers were Manchus ruling over the Chinese, the Qing empire that was larger than modern China today. Official grand portraits exist of all the empresses. And I want to start with the grandeur of this image, but then I will progress to showing informal works that when paired together with objects used by women can help us reconstruct the texture of women's daily lives, despite the scarcity of recorded information in the androcentric Qing court histories. I'm going to make a plea as we look at this dignified, intelligent looking woman whom history reveals was the focus of a huge amount of attention from her imperial son. Snippets from historical texts reveal that she sometimes gave advice to the emperor that he chose to follow and even recorded in the records. What we don't know is how much advice she gave or how many other women gave him advice. The only snippets that make it into the history books are what the emperor chose to record. So I'm setting out a red flag at the beginning. So much about court women is not known. Yet we can confidently say that the top level consorts and the empress was the highest ranking consort had significant roles to play with authority in maintaining and nurturing the family, the imperial household, and they held some ritual duties. Now, what is my plea that I spoke of? My plea is that as you look at this and all the other images, please do not try to drag the empresses and other consorts into the 21st century. We must engage with them on their own terms within their own historical period that is quite different than our notions of gender today. Using research tools available, now we can use inventory lists from the Palace Museum that reveal in some cases what the women actually used in their residences. We can look at traces of the physical spaces they occupied in the Forbidden City, and we can look at paintings of them that when put together, let us speculate, and I say speculate, about what the daily life was of the empresses. So it's a lot of educated speculation and deep historical sleuthing. This image is a crash course on the position of imperial women in the Qing. The Qing court was at all times filled with a vast number of consorts or wives, as well as a larger roster of serving women. The degree of privilege of each woman was commensurate with her status in a hierarchical pyramidal structure as seen here. A woman's clothing, her number of maids, the types of food she ate were all based on her rank in this pyramid. We need to remember that the court was ruled and presided over by the emperor. Here, perhaps the best known in the Qing, the Qianlong emperor is standing in on my chart for all emperors. The emperor is above all. Among the court women, the empress dowager, that is the mother of an emperor, a widow of an emperor was the most senior woman. And below her were eight ranks of consorts of which the empress was rank one. The higher the rank, the fewer number of women who could hold that rank simultaneously. So there was only one empress at the time. All the top consorts lived very well, but indeed the Qianlong emperor had more than 40 wives at a time. So they had to vie for his attention. I also want to say at the outset that all the consorts were inalienable possessions of the emperor. Yes, possessions, but that is not to say that they did not receive respect. And in some cases we can even document receive love. The women had status and were treated by and large by the emperor within the confines of accepted ritual behaviors and propriety. They were valued members of the imperial community. 
Now, all consorts were chosen through a draft with the emperor and empress dowager vital in making the choices of who entered as a lower level consort or occasionally as the top, as the aunt. Empress. The grandest way to become an empress was to marry into the position if it were empty, but only four out of some two dozen Qing empresses entered the Forbidden City through a grand imperial wedding. Here you see one of the many illustrations depicting the marriage of the Guangxu Emperor to his bride, the Shaoding Empress. She is seen here inside the palaquin. Here is a ritual drawing showing what the palaquin was supposed to look like, carefully displayed described, and every detail of the wedding was carefully, ritually mapped out. And I show her bridal robe, Shaoding's bridal robe, or one of the many robes she had. It has eight roundels like this, with a dragon representing the emperor on one side and a phoenix representing the empress on another, and the symbol for uh, double happiness, for conjugal bliss, togetherness in the center. That idea of conjugal bliss in the imperial context always meant to have an heir, to have a son. And I love the detail of the button of the robe, which you see here. It's a little lotus seed pod. The word for seed in Chinese is a homophone for uh, having a son, S-O-N. So what I want to point out in the beginning is the single greatest pressure on the empress and on any other consort was fertility. Bearing a son was the ticket to happiness and promotion up the ladder if you come in below the level of empress. The Chenlong uh, emperor's mother, in fact, entered the palace in a low position, but ultimately became the grandest woman imaginable. Now, whatever level of consort you were, you lived following strict uh, rules of the court. But I argue that it is anachronistic for us to look at the Manchu consorts as living a quote, tormented life, a quote from a 2018 book about the Forbidden City's women. I am not an apologist for the wrongs inflicted on women by previous generations of men, but we need to break the stereotype that being a court woman was a dismal life. These red walls were not a prison. The women were mobile, and not just within the Forbidden City, but in areas outside. Consorts went hunting in the far north of the Chinese Empire at the side of the emperor, at least through the 18th century. They traveled in supervised ways and were not seen by the general public or by court men in general, but they were not locked up. And the gorgeous socks that you see on the left show that Manchu women never had bound feet. Also, just imagine the luxury of an empress. These socks, which would be hidden, their underwear, uh, are embroidered with gold thread. Now, I want to introduce something about the consorts through a glimpse of their lifestyle, seen through the furnishings of their residences, their clothing, and some of their leisure pastimes, such as celebrating festivals. Here we look into a bedroom on the right and a living space for the Empress Dowager Chongqing as reconstructed today by Palace Museum staff. And I've lined up below a few objects that I know from court records were used by consorts. An exquisite hand warmer on the left, a hand warmer, a mundane object, but made with gold and black lacquer, stunning. A porcelain, gorgeous, exquisitely done, and note the motif, it's children. You will see throughout, there is a lay motif of images of fertility and family in the decorations of the palace women. A scepter that is a symbol of good wishes and an exquisite golden ewer decorated with cloisonne. Now, when I started my research, I encountered this line from Lord George McCartney, who visited the Chenlong Emperor on behalf of the King of England. After a dazzling tour of the Forbidden City in 1793, he wrote, quote, I am told that the fine things we have seen are far exceeded by others of the same kind in the apartments of the ladies, end of quote. Perversely, for many, many years, scholars did not believe this. 
And they said that an object as expensive, as luxurious as a solid gold ewer decorated with enamel was too expensive, too special to have been used by an empress, and that it could only have been used by the emperor. But research of inventory lists is now showing us something else, that what McCartney said is true. The empresses had access to the finest quality things, albeit they had to be bestowed on them by the emperor. So there is a degree of connection to your place in his heart with how much the imperial household will give you, but there is also a certain amount that just comes to you due to your rank. Now with this juxtaposition of images, I want to establish two viable ways to get at the lives of Qing empresses and all consorts. Through the objects in the palace inventories that we know they used, such as the dressing case at the bottom that you see open and closed. This was found in the Palace of Longevity and Health, which was the residence of the Empress Dowager Chongqing and then subsequent other uh, consorts. A consort making her toilet was an important act because one of the five virtues and duties of a woman was to have a so-called wifely appearance. This is both deportment and also physical attractiveness. I believe that not enough scholarship has devote, been devoted to women's sexuality and sensuality. But let's face it, if you are going to bear imperial children, there must be something in the code of conduct allowing you to make yourself physically alluring to your husband. Now, the other route that we can go for investigating women is paintings of them. It's a rather complicated category because we always have to ask, is an image in a generic picture of a beauty or is it in fact a depiction of a court consort? This image of a woman at her toilet is stunning. She has a hairpin on the table and is shown inserting one in her hair. The windows with the blue gauze that you see are actual windows that you see and encounter in the palace in the Forbidden City. Behind her, a garden is filled with lotus. Remember lotus seeds and bearing suns? Perhaps a little clue. They're also a symbol of peace and harmony. So when we look at this painting, the jewelry box on the far right, for instance, I can find one exactly like it in the palace collection. So there's a lot about it that says to you, okay, this is a depiction of a court woman. But what about her clothing? What about these really wide sleeves? Why does this dress look more like it is a Chinese style of dress and not what we know Manchu women wore, which was strictly Manchu dress? So I want to point out the fact that often we find in informal portraits of Qing court women, they were shown in a kind of fantasy dress that draws on Chinese tradition and was called by the Manchus antique garb. It wasn't called Chinese garb. Now, to prove the point that we shouldn't be too cavalier about saying this painting of the woman is just a beauty because the costume doesn't fit what we expect for Manchu women, I want to point out that it is not a generic woman, that it was made as a pair with this veristic portrait of the Qianlong Emperor. Although the paintings have faded differently, the blue on his sleeves here matches the blue of her robe. The size of the portraits is identical. They both have orchids in them. There's so many details that show they were made as a pair. The emperor would not have had himself paired with a fantasy woman. He's being paired with one of his wives. And he had himself depicted in this fantasy garment of an ancient Chinese style rather than in Manchu garb. So the Qianlong emperor saw himself as a universal ruler who could embody multiple ethnicities and identities simultaneously. And in commissioning the images of his women, his wives, he could allow them too to embody a space that combines the real palace environment set with actual palace furnishings, but which the painters expand beyond the reality of one moment in time to instead allow the pair of portraits to encompass a vision of rulership with a Manchu emperor and wife 
so secure in their own identity as to be shown wearing fantasy clothing that nods to the Chinese empire and the long distant tradition that they now preside over. Now I turn to perhaps the best known paintings of women in the early 17th century um, done for the Qing court when the Yongzheng emperor was still a prince. They're known by various titles. The most popular one has been translated as the 12 beauties. And that implies that these women are also fantasy images of Southern Chinese beauties. But despite how much has been written about these paintings, scholars are divided in two camps. One, that they're beauties, or two, that they are actual Manchu consorts who lived with the heir apparent who became the Yongzheng emperor. I started my scholarly life believing them to be imaginary beauties and published them once as such. Now I reprint. Indeed, I call them no longer the 12 beauties, but the 12 ladies depictions of real women in actual palace settings, but who have been painted with layers of fantasy, most especially the costume. So again, this is antique dress. So the clothing wraps around the women in a narrative connecting them to over a thousand year history of stories of virtuous women applauded by Chinese culture. So they've been drawn into the Chinese tradition of virtuous women, perhaps through the clothing. But evidence shows, and I thank the Palace Museum scholar Lin Xu, that these paintings were stored in a side room of the palace hall dedicated to housing ritual portraits of emperors and empresses. It would have been anathema to house images of fictitious beauties uh, in a space like that. So we have to take these paintings, we have to take them as evidence of the consort's lives, the garden details, the actual objects, we can all verify. Their activities such as sewing, reading, drinking tea, or viewing antiquities fit into documented activities of imperial consorts. We do poorly to treat these as either totally veristic or as complete fantasy. So we have to use them carefully, but I think they can tell us something about the pleasure in women's lives. We also will see with some of them, they have very suggestive body poses or they expose a bit of their flesh, um, an arm more than usual. This kind of sexual innuendo in the paintings may not just be um, from the male perspective, as is usually said, but it may be a sense of the man and the woman actually did have sexual allure. They did have a reason to get together to bear children. And we shouldn't always deny uh, Qing women's sexuality. I focus on this one very briefly because look at the painting and you see a treasure cabinet filled with antiques. This gorgeous lacquer cabinet, which is one of a pair and you're seeing it from two angles, used to be said and published as belonging to the Qianlong Emperor. In fact, he gave it to his mother. It was a woman's cabinet and therefore we can begin to see that what is in these 12 paintings corresponds to what the women possessed. Just like the heir apparent who became Yong Zhong had a lacquer cabinet filled with antiquities, so did the women. Now, what did the imperial women collect and how do they appreciate art? It's rather complicated to answer this because we don't think the women collected in the usual sense. What they had as art objects was bestowed on them by the emperor. Yet, when you look at this exquisite ancient calligraphy in the upper right, you are seeing something that the Qianlong emperor loved and used as a sign of his own connoisseurship and his collecting prowess. Why would he have given it to his mother if he didn't think that she could not and would not truly and genuinely enjoy it. So I want to argue that the women 
were capable of judging and appreciating art. I show the calligraphy next to a tour de force ivory carving from a set of 12 panels, which each depicts an intimate scene of court women enjoying seasonal activities of the month. The source of imagery is from a painted album by Chen Mei. And in 1741, the Qianlong emperor who loved this image of uh, women enjoying themselves in the court had an ivory set made as well. That's also furnished with gold and gemstones and polychrome. It's really a exquisite artwork or 12 artworks. And so the activities that the women enjoy include um, at the end of the year, looking for plum blossoms in the snow, at the beginning of the year, they're uh, playing chess, uh, they're swinging under, on swings under willow trees, and also we find them in the 11th month enjoying antiquity. So this is a set and established activity for women. Now, having just looked at what I can argue from the position of those paintings having been stored in the same building as ritual imperial portraits, what do you do when you have a painting like this that has no title? We don't know that it is a Qing consort, but it well could be because everything about it now fits in the tradition that we've just been looking at. And here, I'm just going to very briefly point out, again, she's at her toilet. This act of, of putting on makeup, wifely appearance, it was actually said to be a conjugal act. So this is again appropriate if this is one of his consorts. But when is the last time that you put on your makeup and you asked your servant to pull a book out of the bookshelf? I don't think this is necessarily simultaneous. But what we're having the artist capture for us is that the woman is beautiful and the woman is literate. The empresses and top consorts were responsible for teaching the very young princes how to read before they were turned over to male tutors. The exquisite objects on the back table, one of them is a little box, a wooden box with a glass front. These exist in the Palace Museum today and a porcelain image of the Bodhisattva Guan Yin inside, a Bodhisattva that women pray to, to have children. So that fertility motif continues. One of the uh, images of the 12 women is playing chess. And you see here two uh, boxes with chess. And again, this is Chinese chess, Wei Qi, and a chess board. So mixed with a strategy of playing chess is a scene of butterflies, and one actually penetrating a daylily flower. The daylily flower sounds like to bear sons. So we have fertility happening at the same moment that we know that the woman can play chess with uh, her imperial husband. We have a clearly documentable portrait of the Empress Dowager Tzu Xi around 1900 playing the game, the uh, chess game, strategy game with her son. So we know that these women had intelligence and power. We also know that they celebrated festivals. And this is an incredibly grand 12 panel screen. And here I show you a detail that has women preparing offerings to celebrate what is called the double seventh. It happens on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month, or the festival can be called uh, Qi Chao pleading for skills in needlework. It's a talent of uh, needlework, weaving, embroidering, that's deemed essential for attracting and pleasing a spouse. Now it's a festival too that's tied to a love story. We have a weaving maiden, get that, weaving maiden, and a herd boy that fall in love. One is a celestial being, one is earthly, they get separated by the heavenly goddess, and then they're only allowed to meet once a year when all the magpies in the world fly together and make a bridge between earth and heaven. So this holiday of double seven, it's especially important for women to be praying for needlework skills and it's a love story. But this has been a screen commissioned, we know from the record by the Qianlong emperor to give to uh, some of his women as a backdrop while they're sitting in an open courtyard building uh, making their offerings about 
wishes for needlework. So he's thinking of them and he's putting this holiday in a context. There are also scenes in this screen of plowing. So women sustain sericulture, men sustain agriculture, the two foundations of the Qing Empire's economic set, uh, stability. And so this gorgeous uh, accoutrement for enjoying the holiday has been cast into a reminder of the women's virtue and obligation to promote sericulture in order to serve the emperor and serve the state. Now, Going to Chen Mei, who did the album of 12 uh, activities of the year that was also copied into Ivory, I just show here the version, uh, his version of the double seventh holiday. And I'm going to show you just a couple details. The holiday uh, here, we have women who are pulling a needle out of a bowl of water. If a needle's thrown in and it floats to the top, then a woman who gets that needle is ready for marriage. And here on the far right, we're seeing women in a friendly competition. They are competing at dusk for who can thread the needle the best. So these activities have meaning, but they're truly fun. And we also have in the 10th month, the activity of embroidering. I'm tired of reading texts that tell us, oh, women embroidered, but men painted. It's not that one is better than the other. They're both creative acts. And women actually have texts that express how creative the art of sewing is. So let's not disdain it, but let's look at these women as leading a very fulfilled life. By and large, of course, there's pressure of fertility all the time. I finish with this exquisite and unusual robe that I believe may well have belonged to the Empress Dowager Chongqing. Why do I believe that? Because the robe has a tag affixed to it of 1777, the year she died. Now women, despite how much they were respected, they did not own their property. It was owned by the imperial household. And when they died, things that were expensive, important, and in good condition were actually sent back to the imperial household where they could be reassigned to another woman of the same status. So that this went back into storage in the year she died is suggestive. It's not proof. But look at this robe. It's decorated with eight, eight being an auspicious number, uh, vases in porcelain, bronze here, jade, I'll show you uh, a detail to conclude. It's an exquisite robe that depicts these uh, vases so variistically that they actually are ones we can identify as being in the palace. It seems that the woman who wore this robe was actually enabling uh, herself to be at the center, the axis of her own residential empire, if you will. All the flowers are filled with wishes for peace. Um, begonia can mean uh, peace for the four seas. It's all auspicious and grand, but it has a very suggestive layer of connecting to an actual woman's residence. So could the woman have asked for this style robe? We have no records telling us that women could request what they wanted in the 18th century. But being so close to the emperor, perhaps she gave him an idea. What we do know is that by the 19th century, we have records of women actually showing agency in the design of fashion. So perhaps we can think back and conclude with this as a way to say there is still a lot that we need to uncover about the agency of women. But we can say they lived enormously satisfying lives by and large, unless, of course, you did not have a child. History could forget women, but I, as a 21st century woman, don't want to live in the past in any culture. If I did, I think I would be very happy to have been a Qing consort. Thank you.
Oh, Jan, that was just so magnificent. Thank you so much. What an eye-opening, eye-opening account and exquisite images. So it was just fascinating. So um, without further ado, let's welcome Dia Jing to the screen. Dia Jing is a wonderful expert on architecture in the Forbidden City and is going to talk about the women's quarters in the palace. So Dia Jing, welcome. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to introduce uh, our Chinese uh, traditional cultures uh, uh, of the Forbidden City. Now, uh, my presentation topic is uh, order and freedom, ritual and uh, recreational spaces for the empresses and uh, concubines. Now, um, Confucian culture includes a combination of the rites and arts, which in the traditional Chinese dwelling expresses himself in the integration of the houses and gardens. Uh, in other words, in many cases, besides the house, there often has a beautiful garden where the owner and his friends can enjoy, can enjoy themselves. Well, in the palatial complex, this conception involved into the union of the palace and the garden. For example, in the Forbidden City, there are 1,000 buildings and four gardens. Now in here, um, palace refers to the building spaces where the emperors, empresses, and concubines dwelt and hold ceremonies. Palace spaces are regular and solemn, and guiding people to obey the rights and rules and restrain their actions. It was model ritual space. Now the palace garden was the green space in and around the palace complexes dedicated to enjoyment and lure. Besides some uh, buildings, the main space of the garden contains trees, flowers, ponds, uh, and uh, rockery. It makes people happy and forms a space of joy. Now the uh, empresses of the Qing dynasty were key on managing their palaces and gardens. Now, for example, there are four gardens in the Forbidden City and three gardens besides the Forbidden City and five gardens on the outskirts of the Beijing city. The Forbidden City is divided into inner and outer courts. The empresses and the concubines were confined to the area in the north of the Gate of Heavenly Purity. The main living and uh, <clears throat> ceremonial space were the Hall of Union and space of the earlier tranquility. Uh, on the uh, central's axis, this is the central's axis, and there are six, six uh, east, uh, eastern and western palaces on both sides of the control axis. In this area, the count ladies need to act according to their social rules and uh, uh, regulate their behavior to follow the count etiquette. Their main reactional space was four gardens in this area, especially the imperial garden in which they could return to nature and cultivate their months. Now this is the Forbidden City's uh, um, cent central axis. The central axis is the palace, is the ritual axis. Almost every building are the crucial as the site of the important state ceremonial activities. On the central access, there are two buildings which related to the empresses. 
One is the palace of the earth, uh, earthly tranquility, which is the place of uh, emperor's wedding. The other is the palace, uh, palace uh, the other is the hall of union, which is the place to relate to the sacrifice of silk worm guard. Now th this is the palace of the earlier tranquility. Now the, in the Qing dynasty's uh, emperor's wedding is known as the grand wedding, which is the most sig significant natural ceremony. One of the functions of the palace of the earthly tranquility was the uh, bridal, uh, bridal chamber for emperor's wedding ceremonies, representing the uh, combination of the yin and yang, as well as the harmony uh, between the heaven and the earth. Now, in, as we know, in ancient China, dragon was the symbol of the emperor, and the phoenix is usually referred to the empresses. Then in the palace of the earthly tranquility, the uh, decorative patterns on the wood structures are the, um, are the dragons and the uh, phoenix, now which indicates that it uh, is used by the emperor and uh, empresses. Now in the area of the mental uh, of the man telling and the uh, woman weaving silk silk farming and ruling were the woman's special duty and the presses was required to lead by example now let's uh, see these pictures this shows the <coughs> empress xiaoxian presiding over the rights of the sericulture now this shows the um, empresses of the Qianlong Emperor brought the uh, concubines and uh, princes and wives of the nobles to prefer the sacrificial ritual at the altar in the spring. Now, on the day before this ritual, the empresses inspected the um, mulberry picking tools in the hall of the union to check that those tools were properly prepared. The decorative par partners are also the dragons and the phoenix in this hall, as the same as that of the earthly tranquility. This means it is used by the uh, emperors and empresses. Now, this is the six eastern and uh, west and western palaces, which on the both sides of the centuries axis, they were, they were occupied by the concubines. Now, in the uh, Jin's presentation, they show they shows us the ranks of the uh, concerts. Now, um, every concert there were also the rules for the buildings in which they lived. Now, for example, now that's the uh, left left picture in the group of buildings. The high grade uh, concubines lived in the main hall. This is the most important, the main hall. And the other concubines lived, uh, lived in the auxiliary hall, and their servants lived in the worst, worst room in these groups. Now, among the buildings of uh, the hall of mental cultivation, uh, the, cult the mental cultivation hall where the um, emperors like to live and work, the temporary residence of the concubines who come to sleep with the emperor can clearly show this grant. The, uh, em empress, the empress li lived in the east room close to the emperor's bedroom. The imperial 
noble concert lived in the west in west room. Now, as we know in China, the east is more important in the west. Now, uh, well, the other the other concubines and concerts could only live in the smaller and secondary rooms. Now, this is the main hall uh, in the dwelling of the empress or concubines. Now, in the main hall, um, the function of the each bay uh, in the main hall is different from others. For example, the, the throne was placed in the center bay of the main hall, from which the owner received the greeting from the concubines of the lower ranks. Now the secondary and the outer bays on both sides of the center bay saved more arid needs, including living and sleeping spaces. In this area, the ladies enjoy a certain degree of privacy, although their behavior was still restricted by the ritual order. Now in the ritual space, empresses and concubines need to abide by the rules of the counter However, things were quite different in the gardens. This is because gardens are the medium between people and nature in Chinese traditional culture. Wandering in it, people could forget the uh, shackles of the social order and devote themselves to the appreciation of the nature so as to achieve calmness of mind and uh, sublimation of the emotion. Let's see these pictures. Uh, this painting shows in the Ming Dynasty, the Xuande em Emperor engaged in sport, game, sport games in Emperor Garden. Now image above, above showed the Emperor was throwing an arrow into a bottle. The pictures below shows people uh, were shooting arrows. Now let's see this, the, this two pictures. The, the, the picture shows the Qianlong emperors and his concubines uh, were watching their children's game. Now the, the children uh, are making snowmen or sighting of uh, fire rankers in the garden. Uh, we can see a very happy and harmony family. Now the, the, female, the females has the uh, same activities in the garden. This is the famous pictures of 12 beauty who were the Yongzheng emperor's concubines, as we know. The scenes in the painting series were clearly set in the uh, gardens. The ladies are um, portrayed engaged in all kinds of lazy activities, including readings, uh, watching cats and uh, taste tea and appreciating flowers and bamboos. Now this pursuit of pleasure in the cart of the season, uh, this, picture, uh, this series pictures uh, describe the life of the emperor's uh, concubines in palace for 12 months a year in the garden. Now in the garden, in the garden of our Forbidden City, we can find the same place as the painting. For example, um, in August, the, the moon appreciation, it um, depicts the scene of ladies gathering on the platform to sing poems and enjoy the moon on the night of the Middle August Festival. Now in our Impro Garden, the Impro Pavilion stands high, high above, uh, above the rockery, which is where the emperor, Empress and the Emperor enjoy the moon. 
Now let's look at the picture. The picture shows the ladies gathering in a, in a pool pavilion to enjoy finish for the later time. In uh, in Progard, uh, we can find some some the same place to watch the uh, watch the fish. Now appreciating the flowers is the common activities in our gardens. Now enjoying the snow and making team are the most common games in winter in the garden. Now in the later Qing Dynasty, a group of a group of photographs recorded the later uh, activities of the lady in the emperor garden. Now let's see the left picture. Left picture. This is the um, uh, consult uh, Dowager Duan Kang. Uh, she sit carefully on the rock with a smile on her face. Now on the on the right pictures, uh, in contrast, we can see in the palace the Dowager Cixi sat on the row in the palace with a serious face. Now this girl is the is the Wen Xiu, who is the um, who is Xuantong's emperor's concubines. This picture shows she is climbing a tree, very happy. Now, uh, in the in the red pictures, we uh, in the, we can see in the garden the emperor Puyi and his wife uh, and young siblings stand together in harmony. But in contrast, in the birthday celebration of the uh, empress's daughter um, Chongqing. This picture showed the concubines were are seated on both sides of the emperor and the daughter according to their rank. Every woman, uh, every woman in the palace had her own position in accordance with the ritual system. This explains fully that people behave differently in a different setting in the forbidden city. Now, in conclusion, the combination of the rights and arts uh, I uh, advocate in traditional Chinese culture strikes a sound balance between people's role in society and their independence. We are reminding people to keep their roles within the social order, the preservation of their personality and the spiritual freedom are not neglected while taking on their roles and uh, assemble their social responsibilities inside their palaces. They also use their garden spaces as heaven, literating their bodies and mind. Lace was the great value of the combination of the palaces and the gardens. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jing, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. And how interesting to learn that there was um, more opportunity to have fun and a little more freedom in the gardens um, than there was inside the palaces. So that was just great. Um, so let's now welcome all of you back to the back to the stage. Dia Jing, we've got you here. Jan Stewart, please come back. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Jay Xu, who is, of course, the director of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, what a star-studded evening we have. And um, so, Jay, welcome to this conversation. And um, over to all of you. I know you could, there's a lot to talk about now that we've seen your images. Good evening, everyone. So, um, Dinda, should I get started? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. I see so many uh, audiences uh, are participating. So, good evening, and play probably in Beijing certainly. Uh, good morning, and as well as maybe good afternoon somewhere else. And uh, digital age is truly global. It's delighted and honored to participate in this uh, wonderful panel discussion. I think my only ticket of eligibility 
to participate with these two esteemed scholars is that the Asian Art Museum in the past has uh, worked with both palace museums in Beijing and in Taipei to mount the major exhibitions. And uh, we were delighted to be able to showcase palace art with the public in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area as well as for people from all over the world. So um, um, since I don't uh, profess to be a Qing specialist, let alone the women's art and the life in the Qing Imperial Court, so I only have a few uh, brief random thoughts to share with you. And then my main job is to stimulate some questions among our, those two speakers. So if, if any of my comments or questions come across as uh, naive, then I think only it helps to serve to, to, to uh, stimulate the conversation perhaps. My first impression is that what a rare opportunity to uh, discuss the women's life, core ladies' life uh, in Imperial China, in this case, uh, the Qing, primary Qing dynasty. You know, we either know a little about the women's life in general and in court art, uh, in court life in particular, or often the case of women's life were reduced to very simple tropes or stereotypes. So with these two talks, we have such an opportunity to have a scholarship based observations to tell us about the essential features of a women's life. I think in Jen's case, through utilizing artifacts associated with women's life and also visual representations, we get to get some very rare glimpse of their positions, their livelihood in the imperial court. And the Dia Qing really set the stage for further investigation because her talk is primarily focused on the architecture. Architecture is a stage upon which life is lived out. So I think for the first time that for me, that to have such a good comprehensive survey of the uh, arenas upon which the women's activities pri were primarily carried out. I think I can speak for all the panelists and for all the uh, audiences yeah, that you will well, want to join me to thank uh, these two scholars. Of course, also the director Wang for his amazing introduction. Some particular comments about uh, Jen's talk. I think she, first of all, brought out a very important observation that we could not use 21st century's value to change the life, whether women or men in this case, back in the 18th centuries or throughout the entire imperial period. I think one thing that uh, echoed with me is that actually everyone had restraints, but particularly women were subjected to severe restraints. Under that circumstances, the creativity and the ingenuity of women in artistic consumption and in shaping the artistic taste of core life became extraordinarily precious and valuable. And I hope that in future we'll have a more opportunity to learn. But I think the whole uh, underlining principle sort of governing the life of Chinese uh, 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 people, including the imperial life, is this idea of a reciprocity, that everyone has certain responsibility in our reciprocal relationship, that including emperor as well. And uh, in this case, I think uh, Jen has laid out quite clearly, you know, the, um, the responsibilities and expectations, constraints, as well as the ingenuity. So I think, you know, even for, even for artists, right, we're all, live within constraints. And because of the constraints, the creativity becomes even more extraordinary. So I really appreciate that all the wonderful uh, artifacts and the visual images that Jen has shared, shared with us. The other is that um, in uh, D.R. Jin's uh, uh, context, that I think she laid out a very important uh, concept. And the concept uh, I may call the dichotomy between public and private. I think if I understand her correctly, you know, of course, the women have their particular uh, uh, palaces in which they lived out most of their life. 
according to the ranks in the imperial court, they were assigned the particular residences. So these were maybe more private spaces. And but the imperial garden, the particularly the garden that the northmost garden is so seemed to be a more public space, a space for pleasure, space for socializing. And but that dichotomy actually will bring forth a very a set of very interesting questions. So uh, with this very brief comments, I'd like to next move to actually asking our speakers uh, some questions. So for Jen, let me start out uh, requesting to make comments on the 12 ladies, right? And uh, you have changed your mind over the course of years. So I would like to learn more what made you change of mind. And for me, um, a non-specialist that I, um, uh, what strikes me is that they depict types, not so much individuality, sort of a seasonal activities that core ladies are engaged in. And there's a no very particular or immediate um, marker to identify the individuals. So that's why I would sort of, uh, stop a bit short of calling them portraits. I think uh, we're calling them images of lady in different activities. And uh, certainly I would like to learn more about that. And uh, what, you know, you can tell us about uh, how you change your mind and uh, what the other stories associated with those portraits. Oh, I call it portrait myself because they are images of uh, uh, figures. So those figurative paintings tell us. Well, thank you for such a tough question. <laughs> it's always a good way to expand the mind. It is an exceedingly complex situation that there certainly are still scholars in both camps. Those who now agree with me that these are depictions of actual palace women and those who still think they're fantasy beauties. A lot of what helped me understand them as real people is exactly where they were stored in the palace. Um, according to Lin Shu and some of her colleagues' research, in fact, when they were first taken off view in the palace, whenever that was, we don't have the exact date, they were stored next to a sculpture uh, image of the Yongzhong Emperor. So again, you wouldn't have just generic beauties in this close proximity to the emperor. And then when the inventory revealed that after a particular palace um, fire towards the end of the Qing, the paintings were moved from being next to a statue of the emperor and put into the imperial hall for the ritual portraits, albeit put in a side room because these have nothing to do with ritual, um, that sort of made me see, yes, they have to be real people or these paintings would not have been treated with that status, that's care. So that's one thing that makes me know they're real people. <laughs> now, I worry about all of our skills as art historians, as, as judges of paintings because it's amazing. In one book I've read, the women's faces are described as quintessentially Chinese. In another book I've read, they are described as quintessentially Manchu. Um, I, along with other scholars, have tried to say how many concubines are depicted um, because some of the faces look so identical that you think, ah, oh, yes, that's a real person. But I'm not sure if there are three or four women in there. So it seems that verism the way you can identify it in a Castiglione portrait of Chen Long is not part of the, the purpose. So it is this, um, I think you're right not to call them depictions. I mean, not to call them portraits, but to call them depictions. That's why I call them, um, you know, Prince Yin Zheng's 12 ladies. They are some kind of combination of realism, real people, but they're close. Um, with fantasy that I think connects to sexuality, 
his sexual fantasies with his wives, but also his admission that a wife should be sexually alluring and they have to produce the male heir. So that's okay. We used to have scholars say, oh, you would never say they're consorts because a consort would never be depicted in such an alluring pose. But he's the only one who ever saw these paintings. So why not? So I've come to think more broadly about what is allowed in the Qing court and that these can be real women and every detail that you find in the accoutrements, etc., cetera, has a real match in the palace. So they're real places. Wonderful. And so Thank that's you for your... the balance for me. Yeah, I certainly you know, adds a lot to the narrative. And I will ask you a follow-up question then I will switch it to uh, D.R. Jing. Mm -hmm. that, of course, I wish we could get into Yongzheng's mind, and then we can, he could tell us all about them, because you probably, you know, uh, know every detail of those uh, paintings, and um, and you, of course, raise a, a, a point about, uh, uh, the, of course, the individuality is the 12 ladies, or one lady in many different garbs on different settings, or several ladies. All these are open questions, but I want to use this, uh, um, question to lead to a uh, more generic question is that you pointed out this is only seen by Yong Zhen and because these are her ladies. So assume these are not circulated for viewing after Yong Zhen died or maybe you can tell something different. But the, the larger question is that today we can go to the Paris museums to see uh, uh, the imperial portraits even those used for ritual sacrifices, including the other figurative paintings, as long as they are on view or through print or digital media. But at their own time, who got to see them and, uh, and, and how they were used? I mean, we know a lot more about uh, the, uh, the ancestral portraits, but what are all the other paintings and how they were consumed and how they were used? Could you tell us more about that? Well, the records aren't always clear, but for example, this idea of painting 12 images of women in seasonal activities, um, there are quite a few different sets of that made. There were also sets made of the emperor in 12 seasonal activities, but we have some records where Qianlong actually specifies oh, take the image of women for a double seven for the holiday associated with Sarah culture and send that to consort rank number two and let it be a reminder of her role and her duties. So we know that some of these paintings have a didactic moralizing uh, value that the emperor could choose which women to share an image with and he could convey a message. We know some of the images apparently were, were mostly seen by the emperor. And in, in Chen Mei's album of the 12 um, seasonal activities, he has more than 60 seal impressions on the album. And some of those are from when he was still a prince before he had become emperor. And one of those seals is from the very end of his life. So some of these paintings presumably were only seen by the emperor, but seen over and over again. I would like to know more about the sharing. And I think that is a, that's a subject that we as art historians can really work on now. But that's yeah, those you know, something yeah. that we won't have time to get into is that the, uh, the ladies call it, it as a, a, a possible artistic page. Mm -hmm. And when we see the painting, typically we default to think that they must be commissioned by the emperor. Now I was always curious, you know, in what way that women, in addition to what you already laid out for us, in what other way they serve, express their agency and they serve as artistic But that sort of uh, maybe for future that uh, Jen can, through lectures and writing, educate all of us. Now, uh, Dia Qing, what I want to uh, emphasize on, and you want very salient point you mentioned in your talk is that the Imperial Garden inside Forbidden City, okay, as a communal and a social space for Imperial consorts and the core ladies. And I can understand how precious that space is 
because otherwise, as big as the uh, um, imperial uh, forbidden city is, and actually it could be a very confining space. Whenever I visit the forbidden city, for example, including uh, Chen Long's retirement quarter, which he never really lived there, but he never lived, built him something for himself. And um, always this stark contrast of a huge and a petite. On one hand, for the city is huge. There's some have the living space, including the channel's own three treasures studio, right? It's so small. So I think I can, in, along this line, think I can truly understand how valuable the Imperial Garden is. So my question to you is that, was there any regulation? Since every life is so, was so well regulated, was there any regulations that who could use the garden at what time? And was there sort of free access to all the core ladies? They could use it whenever they were like? Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, in the re recording of the literature, uh, we can find a recording. Uh, this is uh, one rule. Uh, when the emperor in the garden. Now, um, no concubines uh, can, can be allowed to go in. Uh, now, it, it is easy to, uh, to understand because uh, every, uh, every emperor has many con concubines. For example, uh, Qianlong Emperor has uh, 82 concubines. Uh, 80, 82, uh, well, no, uh, 42, 42 concubines. And the Kangxi Emperor has uh, 55 concubines. Uh, uh, every uh, concubine uh, want to see his husband every day. So if it's no interest uh, to, uh, for them to enter the uh, garden when the emperor's uh, in the garden. Now, maybe I know the, it is not a good thing for the uh, emperor to enjoy himself for, for the visit time in the garden. So it's one rule when the emperor in uh, combination cannot be uh, in the garden uh, except uh, being invited. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, the other question that I want to relate to the earlier point, you, you showed us the images of the uh, imperial gardens that mm -hmm. in the outskirts of Beijing, as well as the resorts further out, like, uh, you know, and, uh, Chengde and, and, uh, and Mulan, and so on and so forth. So, and, uh, you know, had a lot to do going back to their tradition as hunters, right? You know, as, 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 as uh, uh, semi-nomadic uh, uh, ethnic groups. So. I understand that the Qing emperors were known to prefer to conduct a court business in imperial gardens rather than forbidden city. They prefer the imperial garden resorts far much to the forbidden city. So as they took up extended periods of residence in those places, who among the imperial consorts got to travel with their husbands? <laughs> or was it purely a decision by the emperor based on his preference? Uh, uh, I think it's, it's also interesting. So we know the, uh, the emperor very like garden. This, this, uh, um, it, besides in the Forbidden Cities, there are a lot of gardens on the, on the outskirts of the Beijing city. If, uh, for example, uh, Yongzheng is very like Yuan Mingyuan. Now, every, every year he has an average uh, 200 days in Yuan Mingyuan every day. Now, it, it's, it's very so, so long days, so he can bring he can bring full family to the Yuan Mingyuan because Yuan Mingyuan is uh, the distance uh, uh, is uh, is not very far for the uh, for the forbidden city. It's only half half a year half a year by carriage. 
uh, so he can bring the, his mother, his wife, and concubines, his sons, and his daughter. No, no, go, go to the Yuan Mingyuan. But if he want, uh, if the Qianlong want to Chengde or the Mulan Wei Chang, now they only uh, bring uh, his mother and uh, his uh, empresses and the concubines who he is favorite. All his mother is favorite. Um, when he go to the more far away, uh, such as the journey to the south of China, now the only a uh, few con uh, concubines. For example, uh, he he can bring the, his mother, uh, his uh, empresses, uh, and uh, six concubines uh, f followed her to the south of the China. Now, now, now it, it, it's uh, uh, it is the uh, situation. <laughs> No, thanks. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that uh, the emperor always brought the mother <laughs> with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw Dinda, our time is about up. Just let me say very, very quickly how Go grateful ahead. I think we all are to uh, Dia Jing and Jan Stewart. What a wonderful combination. Your wide ranging talks really complement each other so well. And yeah. I want to emphasize again, those insights are scholarship based. For those of us in our audience are familiar with Chinese TV series, you know, all kinds of crazy stories are going on. This is such a rare opportunity. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Back to you. But you know what, before we, before we close, if you're all willing, the, you know, the audience is so engaged and we still have hundreds of people tuned in. And I'd love, if you don't mind, I'd love to take a couple of questions from the audience. Would that be okay if you have a few minutes? Will you stay on? 10 more minutes? Okay. Sure. okay, great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share a couple of questions. Um, there's one question here for Jen, but maybe also for Dia Jing. Um, the audience member said, notices that in the photograph of the reconstructed Empress Dowager's quarters, uh, and also in some of the twelve ladies uh, images, there are objects which indicate European contact, such as clocks, watches, and what looks like an armillary sphere, is that is that right? Okay, um, so the, the, this person is asking, do you have thoughts on what those objects, you know, represent what the, the bestowal of those objects and whether they, that reflects real objects that they actually would have had in the quarters of the Imperial women? It's a great question, uh, very observant. You should be an art historian. Um, Yes, you are seeing things that are coming from the West and things that are also being made at the Chinese court uh, after Western objects. So the 18th century is a great period of contact with uh, Italian, Belgian, oh European Jesuit coming to the Chinese court, yeah. trying to turn the emperor um, to Catholicism, not succeeding in that mission, but actually serving as artists at the court, serving as scientists. Um, astronomy was one of the fields in particular. So there are these uh, Western inventions and contacts going on, and there definitely were Western objects then that are treasured by the emperor. So if he's has a, a one of his consorts in favor, he may well give one of the Western objects to a consort as a sign of favor. There's also, I believe, a conceit going on with a lot of the assemblage of objects in palace rooms, or at least how they're painted. And that is very often you'll find a combination of objects that include something from almost every dynasty, or at least objects that go back to very distant Chinese history, some objects that are contemporary made by the Chinese court then and there, objects that have come from the West, sometimes objects that have come from Japan. So you're actually setting up a physical environment that stands for the world, which supports the Qianlong Emperor's view of being a universal king, universal rulership. And that view was extended to, I think, how the women's apartments were furnished. 
So I think there's a great parity between the men and women's apartments. There's so much in modern scholarship looking for gendered spaces and that the feminine realm is distinctly different visually. Um, I am less convinced of that, at least at this imperial level. I think there's a lot of equity. Another question for both of you about it's sort of some of the slightly more mundane details of life for the women in the court. One question is, there don't seem to be any fireplaces, so how did they stay warm? That's the first one. But the second one was, were they allowed to go do, did they have any freedoms? Like, were they allowed to go home and visit their parents? So that um, could be a question for- in the, If I may can jump in to, to echo Jen's comment, I agree with her comment about the equity. If we look at those 12 ladies, for example, one picture showing in the setting of uh, antiques. And that is traditionally associated with the man activities. But in this picture, clearly, you know, that is the uh, part of the cultural ambiance that this lady's uh, mm -hmm. uh, depiction uh, took place. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Perhaps Steve yeah, wants to answer about the heating. <laughs> <Braver>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, now uh, I, I have some hands, uh, I have some idea. Now, in, in, in Chinese art, uh, the uh, abstract, uh, uh, the painting and the poem uh, comes from the reality, it, it, it's, it's a common thing. So uh, in so in the paintings we can find we we can find uh, um, many uh, artifacts in our forbidden city in the reality in in, in our in our house. So I I, I think many paintings and poems poems uh, describing things old older material older uh, artifacts. Uh, has the uh, uh, we, we can find in the uh, forbidden city in in the uh, collection and uh, artifactual. Now in the Qing Dynasty, I uh, not not two questions in the Qing Dynasty. Um, the con concubines uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, has, has a better uh, rules, but uh, they has some freedom. For example, um, some concubines can go back their um, mother's house. Uh, when, uh, when, when he followed the empires to the south of China, now they can, uh, his, uh, his, mom, his father can, uh, his father's house is the um, emperor's uh, res resort. So when he followed by the emperor, the, he can go back his uh, go back uh, her uh, her house, her, her mother's and father's house. Mm. Now that, that that's all. Right, got it. I can say there are other records where a woman has applied to go home uh, to her natal home and the emperor has denied that. So it is entirely um, up to him in each and every case. Mm -hmm. As for uh, the lack of fireplaces, the heating system, uh, if you look in those rooms, part of the rooms have a raised brick platform and under that platform, it's empty space that is connected to a flue with an outdoor stove. So there's hot air that's flowing in and heating up the platform. So during the winter, you wear padded clothing, you sit on padded covers on top of a heated platform. So that's what's going to keep you warm. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, and then, of course, they have a hand warmers and many other portable mice. <laughs> and, and braziers and yep. yes. Okay, so let's have, let's have one final question, which is really maybe for all of you to answer. But the question is, because it's quite broad, it's to what extent was the behavior of the ladies of the palace required to, to serve as a model for society at large? Um, you know, as is the, the case maybe in royal families in Japan or the UK today, but were they, were they meant to be a model? I would say very definitely. Um, and, you know, in fact, 
the empress is she is the nominal mother of the entire imperial household so lower rank consorts have children and they are mothers but so is the empress so all children go to her and also some of the women had the titles they were the great sagely mother of the entire empire so they become the mother of the empire and hence they are a model for all women and also a reminder of you need harmony between men and women to have a successful society. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, Dia Jing, that the women were, that, that they did play a role in sort of creating a model for the whole, for the whole society, for the whole country? Yeah, the, the, the very important female is the impresses, is the impress. Now, uh, he is the, he was called the nation's mother. Now, for example, when he in the un, un, union of the hall, uh, he, he is the example to the uh, silk, silkworm guard and to the worship the guard. Now they told they told the um, nation's people the silkworm uh, uh, is is very important in the in the in the nation's uh, in, uh, in, in image. I I saw on. so the. Uh, the 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 emperor is the nation of the father, and the empress is the nation of the mother. It is uh, it is equal to to all of the people in the country. Wow! That's so yeah, status and prestige. Uh, again, speaking to your broader points this evening, uh, fascinating. Well, I just. I'm kind of speechless. I, I am. We are so grateful to all of you, to Dia Jing, to Jan Stewart, to Jay Xu for convening this incredibly interesting conversation and showing us these beautiful, beautiful images and teaching us so much tonight. We are very honored to be working with the Palace Museum. Thank you for that collaboration. We hope to do it again. And this conversation is so important. It's, a, it's arts and culture exchange is what, what we need more of. So thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in. There's still hundreds of people here. So you all draw a big crowd. We're very, very grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. thank you, Jay, for your great <laughs> advice. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, no, everyone. So <laughs> thank you, Diagon.